We're going to get right into the word. Open up your Bibles to Nehemiah and chapter, Nehemiah chapter 3. A couple of weeks ago, we ministered out of Nehemiah chapter 4, where Nehemiah was given the commission, given the burden, if you will, to build, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that were down. How many of you remember that? The walls were down. The walls were down. Why were the walls down? The walls were down because of sin. The walls were down because of disobedience. The walls were down because of a lack of commitment to God. And God scattered his children all over uh, the known world at that time. They were in exile for 70 years in captivity and bondage. That's where we get the, 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 the story about uh, uh, the three Hebrew children under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, and the lion's den. All that took place during the 70 years of exile. Now Nehemiah is going to come back. God puts it on his heart. He gets favor from the king. He gets favor from all those uh, that would uh, be uh, on the, uh, the area that he would have to pass through. He gets a letter from the king. He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to rebuild the walls. How many of you know we need some walls to be rebuilt in our day? How many of you believe that there needs to be some walls to be built back up, some strongholds to be pulled down, and some establishments to be reestablished in this society we live in? Anybody agree with me on that? Well, we, we ministered on the rebuilding of the walls, but I, I want you to know there was 12 gates around those walls. Has anybody been to Jerusalem? Y'all went into that, into that old city, remember? Remember the 12 gates that were in the old city? It's interesting that there was 12 gates. 12 is the number of governments. There was 12 apostles in the, in the New Testament that Jesus chose. There was 12 tribes of Israel that were come from the 12 sons. And you would think that the 12 gates might be named after each one of these tribes, but they're not. One of them is, but the rest of them aren't named after the 12 tribes of Israel. These gates are named after the 12 different areas of responsibility and need. What would they use those gates for? And they were named after those needs. And I believe that these 12 gates represent 12 of the areas that we deal with in our life with today. I believe we can look at the 12 gates and we can find where it's a type and shadow of where we are today. Anybody with me? So I'm going to try to unwrap these 12 gates for you in the next few moments. In this chapter, it tells us about the rebuilding of the 12 gates, chapter 3. All down through chapter 3 mentions most of these 12 gates. We have to go to 12, chapter 12 to get a couple of them. But when these gates are mentioned, I want you to take note that as we study this this morning, that these 12 gates weren't built by just any, anybody at random. Every one of these gates, it was, there was an assignment to a gate. A certain family and a certain group would be assigned to take their people and rebuild that particular gate. How many of you know we need to learn from that, that when we're called to do something, we need to stay in our lane. We need to run the race that God's given us. We need to stay true and faithful to that particular thing God's given you to do. You see, don't try to get in somebody else's lane. Run in the lane that God's put you in. And you'll find out as they're building these gates, each person was given assignment for a particular gate. And these particular gates had a particular emphasis or a particular meaning. The first gate that we find is called the valley gate. The valley gate. Are you with me? In Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent wall and to the refuge gate, and I viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which was broken down, and its gates which were burned with fire. The gates were destroyed. The gates were burned. The enemy had come in and ripped the gates off and, and, and tore the walls down. Nehemiah builds the walls. He, 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 he he gets uh, the Israelites work day and night. Sometimes uh, they had to work with a sword in one hand and with a trowel in the other. 
Have you ever had to walk through some things in your life that you had to, uh, that you had to continue to do the work you're called to do, but at the same time have a watchful eye, have on the whole armor of God that you don't be under attack? Is anybody with me? And so, uh, the, so they looked, and he saw uh, that the gates were down. And it says in verse 13, they, they repaired the valley gate. They built it, and they hung the doors with the bolts and the bars and repaired the thousand cubics of the wall as far as the refuge gate. It's mentioning these other gates, but right now is the valley gate. When I gave some thought to the valley gate, I thought when we think of the valley experiences, it, be, it, it brings to mind sometimes bad experiences. I was in the valley, and, and tough times came. It's in the valley uh, that the darkness seems to be on my life. I want to get to the mountaintop where the, uh, where the wind blows a little cooler and, and the breezes are a little fr fresher. I, I don't like to be in the valley. But there's a couple of songs that we sing in the valley. He restores my soul. The psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You see, church, it's in the valley that we have recovery. It's in the valley... Uh, that, 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 uh, that will have healing, but it's in the valley where good things go. When the rains come and, and the storms come and, all the, uh, and the rains come off the mountain and it all gathers down in the valley, that's where the rich soil gathers. It's in the valley where the, uh, where the, uh, the water pools up and the streams are and, and, the, and, and the water runs off the mountain, uh, but it gathers in the valley where there's life and there's victory. It's in the valley where the rich dirt is. Is anybody with me? It's in the valley where the water stabilizes and, and the fish grow and the, and the birds can come and drink and the deer can come and, and drink out of, the, out of the pools of water in the valley. Many times we want the valley experiences to leave our life, but it's the valley experiences that we can learn things. It's the valley experiences that will make us strong so we can go to the mountain and stand strong and say, I'm more than a conqueror. The valley gate. There was something about the valley gate that spoke life. It's where strong, healthy things grow in the valley. It's where battles are won. The battles of life are won in the valley. Most people, they give testimony and share about the goodness of God. And the scripture says, and they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Most of the time, the word of our testimony isn't a mountaintop word. It's a testing in the valley that God brought us through the valley experiences. God brought us through the tough times. God brought us through those things that without him we could have never made it. But God brought us through. And our testimony stands strong because the battle of life was won in the valley. Can you handle the valley gate in your life? Can you handle the times that God will allow you to go into the valley experiences to get a refreshing, to hear his voice? Many times it's lonely. Many times you don't have the crowd gather around you to cheer you on. Sometimes in the valley is a place where, it's, uh, where you have to make it through the night by yourself. Uh, but hey, weeping may come at night, but joy will come in the morning because God will always see you through the valley. This valley gate was there to remind them that the valley experiences, not only in Nehemiah's day, but in your day, in my day, it's the valley experiences that'll, uh, that'll make us strong and make us well and put it again, give us some backbone that we can stand in the time of trouble. It's the valley. It's the valley. Can you handle the valley gate? There was 12 gates, so I'm going to move right along, try to get these gates in this morning. And the next gate is found in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 4. Then I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but where was no room for animals under me to pass, it was the fountain gate. It says in verse uh, 15, the leaders of the district of Mespath repaired the fountain gate. He built it, and he covered it, and he hung the doors and, he, and, and, and the bolts and the bars and repaired the walls of the pool at the fountain gate. You see, the fountain gate's important. The fountain gate has to be part of your life and part of my life. This was the gate where the pool of Siloam was. How many of you remember that? The pool of Siloam. 
pull of Siloam, you'll find it over in John chapter 9 and verse 6. John chapter 9 and verse 6 says, When he had said these things, he spit on the ground, and he made clay with his saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Verse 7 says, And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. Pool of Siloam means sent. So he went and he washed, and he came back, and he could see. He could see. This pool of Siloam was a very important pool, pool, uh, uh, place where everybody gathered right outside the fountain gate. Isn't it interesting that it was a pool and the gate was called fountain gate? Isn't it interesting uh, that, uh, that we're told uh, that the fountain of life is the, is the essence of Jesus the fountain of light flows from the throne room of God. The fountain flows out of the very being of God flows. There's a river that flows. There's a river of light flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. It opens prison doors, sets the captives free. There's a river. Uh, there's a fountain that flows. And if it's flowing out of you and flowing out of me, then we always need to keep the fountain gate open. We need to keep the fountain gate flowing. We need that river to flow out of us and touch every person that's around us. The fountain gate speaks of life. It speaks of energy. Jesus is the river of life. Jesus is the river of life. He's the truth, the life, and the way. No man comes to the Father but by Him. There's a river that flows out. That's the reason why we need to be planted, according to the psalmist in chapter 1, we need to be planted by the rivers of living water where the roots will go deep and the leaves will not wither and the power of God will move because we're plugged into the fountain, we're plugged into the river of life. The streams of God will flow through us and energize us and strengthen us. The fountain gate. You see, you need to, we, we need to have these gates operating in our life. How many of you can see that? These gates are powerful. That's the reason why God played his place on Nehemiah to go build the gates, build the walls and stabilize the gates. These gates weren't little gates like the swings in your backyard. These gate, gates were made out of great big timbers and, and great big planks that were bolted together. And it took many men to pick one up and the hinges were made out of steel uh, uh, with, big, uh, with great big uh, pins that go in so they could swivel back and forth. And these gates would protect the city, the old city inside from the enemies that would try to rush in upon them. There was 12 gates around the city and these gates, everyone was vitally important and everyone was guarded uh, by those that would take their post and stand in there and take their rampart and stand on what they believed in because they was to protect the gate, the fountain gate. This word Siloam, the, the, the pool of Siloam was right outside the fountain gate. And it's interesting that this pool means scent, scent. You see, we need to be sensitive to where God, when we go out that fountain gate, when we go out the gate of life, when we go out uh, the gate, the river of life that flows through us, uh, are we willing to say, Lord, send me? Isaiah, Isaiah said, Here am I, a man of unclean lips that dwells in a place with, uh, with unclean lips in Isaiah 6. In the year the king Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And the Lord said, I need someone to send. Who can I send? And Isaiah said, send me. Send me. He's still looking for people that he can say, who can I send? And they'll say, send me. Who can I use to do evangelism? Who can I use to serve in the local church? Who can I, who can I use to be a model family in the house of God that the people can say, this is what a godly family is? Who can I send uh, to, uh, to walk in a godly marriage that marriage is, is connected in the anointing and the presence of God that we bring up a uh, godly offspring and the anointing of God will flow? Who can he send? The fountain gate was the gate where you would walk through until you got the pool of Siloam. And I, here's what Isaiah said. I hope we can all say this. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I, Lord. Send me. You see, whenever you're willing to say that, God will use you mightily. He'll anoint you. He'll call you and appoint you. 
And then the third gate was the sheep gate. Sheep gate is found in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 1. Is everybody still with me this morning? The sheep gate. If nothing else, just write these gates down. Because these gates are vitally important. These gates are in your life and in my life. Anything that we find in the Old Testament that, uh, that was a type and shadow, it was a type and shadow of where we are today. It's a type and shadow of who Jesus is to us. When we, when we study the, the tabernacle, we find out the whole tabernacle setting was a type and shadow of Jesus today. Nehemiah had a passion to see these gates put back on their hinges, to see the walls fortified. Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 1 says, And the high priest rose up with the brethren and the priest to build the sheep gate. The sheep gate. They consecrated it and they hung the doors. They built as far as the tower of hundred. Consecrated it. Then as far as the tower of Hanel, they built the sheep gate. The reason why it's so important is because the sheep gate was for sacrifices. It was a sacrificial gate. It was where they brought the sacrificial sheep in for sacrifices in the tabernacle. It was brought in through this gate called the sheep gate. All the sheep would come in and when they would have sacrifices and when they would have uh, the, the blood would flow upon the altar and the high priest would sacrifice these animals uh, for, the, uh, for, the for, sake of the, for the sake of the congregation to move their sins up for a year. Aren't you glad we don't have to do that anymore? Aren't you glad that this church don't have a sheep gate where you have to bring in goats and sheep and birds and turtle doves? Aren't you glad we don't have a big brazen altar out in the, in the lobby that, uh, that, that uh, the priests would stand there in their, in their white garb and, and, and kill the animals and the blood would run down through the trough and, and, and run into the tabernacle? Aren't you glad we don't have to do that today? You know why we don't have to do that? Because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. He shed his blood once and for all. Never again will there be a blood sacrifice for the remission of sin. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But we must remember the sheep gate. In John chapter 5 and verse 2 says, Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. We must always remember that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb for the world. That was a type and shadow. Every time a sheep would walk in through that gate, they, uh, they would be looking forward. Remember, they was on the other side of the cross. But we're on this side of the cross. On the other side of the cross, Jesus didn't shed his blood yet, but on this side of the cross, the, uh, the, the price was paid, the blood was shed, the sacrifice is over. And we can stand together and remember, we must remember that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb. In Isaiah 53 and verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. <clears throat> we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was laid as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shears in silence. So he opened not his mouth. He went as a sheep. As they brought the sheep into the sheep gate, the sheep wouldn't, uh, wouldn't complain. The sheep wouldn't try to get away. The sheep would not try to run. The sheep would be led into the slaughterhouse and just stand there until it was killed. Jesus, when he went to the scourging, he didn't speak a word. When they put him on the cross and said, are you the king? He said, you say so. He was silent. He was the ultimate sacrifice as a sheep. And we must remember the sheep gate. In Acts chapter 8, in verse 32, Philip goes and he witnesses to the Ethiopian, if you remember, Ethiopian's coming back from a, a meeting and he's heard the word of God and he's not sure what it means. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 32 says, the place in the scriptures which he read was this. It's interesting of all the scriptures that they had. Now, they didn't have the New Testament Bible like we have today. When they had the scriptures, they didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They didn't have a revelation in the Pauline letters. But the Ethiopian opened up the book, 
this, the, the scroll of Isaiah. And here's what he was reading. He was laid as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before the shear in silence. So he opened not his mouth. And Philip explained to him the scriptures and told him that that was Jesus that he was reading about. And that Jesus paid the ultimate price. And if he would accept Jesus Christ, his own personal Savior, he'd be redeemed and have life everlasting. And the Ethiopian said, I want Jesus in my life. What hinders me to be baptized? And the chariot stopped because there was much water there and he baptized him. Because the anointing of God came upon him because he understood that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice he was our sacrificial lamb. We must remember the sheep gate. Is anybody with me? Then I find in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 3, there's the fish gate. The fish gate. Isn't it interesting? The fish gate is not, it's called the fish gate. It's not named out of one of the tribes of Israel. It's not named after one of the great kings. They didn't name that gate after one of the great uh, cities in that day. It was called a simple little thing called the fish gate. It says in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 3, And also the sons built the fish gate, and they laid its beams, and they hung its doors, and they bolted its bars. You notice it always says that. That they hung its beams, and they laid its doors, and they hung his bolts and his bars. In other words, they completed the gate. They didn't go halfway and stop. They didn't just do a temporary fix so maybe it was swing a little bit and they could open it up some and get out, but they hung these according to the plan. The reason why it was called the fish gate because the fish from the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee were brought through this gate. This was the gate where the food came in. You ever go to a restaurant and you go to eat and you walk in the front front door and <clears throat> there's some nice greeter that greets you there and they make sure you get a seat and, and, and they make sure you know who your waitress is and the restaurant looks fine. But did you ever drive around the back to the back door? There's trucks there. Uh, there's forklifts. Uh, they're taking things in and out the back door because that's where the food supply comes in and out. You don't see that most of the time. All you're seeing is the food that goes on the table because you ordered your meal. But somehow or another, <clears throat> there's a place where the food has to come. There has to be a place, uh, there has to be a place for the transporters to bring it. There has to be a place uh, for those that have to go out and work to get it to bring all the food at that restaurant so we can sit down to a nice meal. Is anybody with me? You see this fish gate. First of all, it spoke of our provision. We need to know about the fish gate because the fish gate is where our provision is. He's Jehovah Jireh, my need meter. He's the God of more than enough. All of my needs are met because of him. He's my provider. Speaks of our provision. And not only speaks of our provision, but speaks of our daily bread, our daily food. You, you remember any time that Jesus fed the multitude, what did he feed them? Bread and fish. It was called the fish gate. Their main supply of food was fish and bread. It was where the Sea of Galilee, they would catch the fish or they would catch the fish <clears throat> in the Jordan River and they would bring it in and supply all the food for the, for the Israelites in the old city through the fish gate. Jesus is our provision today. Jesus is our daily bread. He said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he'll live forever. He's our provision. He, the fish gate represents the provision that he has for us. The fish gate represents that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Is anybody with me? Always keep this gate in good repair. Always keep the fish gate in good repair <clears throat> where the food and the supply could come. When we're not obedient to God, the fish gate might close. When we don't tithe, the fish gate might close. When we're not giving in obedience to God, the fish gate will close. 
and the provision will be cut down. And we'll wonder why we're struggling and why we're working harder and spending more time working and our, and our money bags still have holes in it and everything flows out. Maybe because we have let the fish gate go in bad repair. Is anybody with me? Always keep that gate in good repair because through it will flow God's favor and God's provision. How many of you appreciate God's favor in your life? How many of you want God's provision in your life? He's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I got to have that. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure my fish gate is in good repair and God's provision can flow through. Can anybody see how these gates apply to you today? How about a fifth gate found in Nehemiah chapter 3, 3 and verse 6? It's called the old gate. I like this one. The old gate. Not because I'm old. I just like the old gate. You see, the old gate has significance for me and you today. <clears throat> it says, moreover, they came together and they repaired the old gate. And they laid its beams and they hung its doors and the bolts and bars. <clears throat> because this was the main entrance to the city. Another name for this was called the Damascus Gate. How many of you know what Damascus? How many of you ring a bell with Damascus? Remember when Paul was persecuting the, the, the Jews and having Christians put in jail? And it says he was on his way to persecute more, uh, more believers. And he was on the road to, to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. It was on the road to Damascus that the light shone and God came down and spoke. And the anointing of God came. He was blinded and struck blind and struck off of his mount. And those that were with him heard the voice of God saying, Paul, Paul, why persecute thou me? Why are you kicking against the goads? And Paul said, who are you, Lord? And, and, and he gave his heart to the Lord and went to a street called Straight being struck blind. And there was a man named Ananias that was told to come. And minister to this man that was a persecutor. And, the, and was having, having Christians put in jail and killed. Ananias ministered to Paul. And he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And life was changed forever. And his life was turned around. Let me tell you, don't ever give up on anybody. There's somebody you know that's not where they should be. Keep praying for them. You know there's someone that's not walking with God. You keep talking to God about them. Because if you can't, if you if if he can't use you, he'll send somebody else. He'll send an Ananias your way. Nothing can take the place of the old story. What's the old gate represent? I just want you to <clears throat> be mindful of this that the that the old gate represents first of all the old gospel message. The gospel message changes not. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the old, old story. It's the story of the gospel. It's the story of God's love. It's the ancient of days who is God himself. It's the good old Bible that has been standing as the number one seller for year after year after year. And nothing can outsell this Bible. And it's still the word of God that stands strong <clears throat> through all the persecutions of time. The old gate is the old landmarks and standards that we've always lived by. Like love. Like commitment. Is anybody with me? Like marriage between a man and a woman. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Like the prophets that were willing to prophesy the word of God and proclaim God's truth. The law that was written. The word of God that stands forever. Prayer. Is an old gate. They prayed back in Jesus' day. They prayed back in the Old Testament. Moses prayed. Jeremiah prayed. Isaiah prayed. Prayer is part of that old gate, and we never need to think that we can't do without it. The church is part of the old gate. Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Then, of course, Jesus reminds me, when I think of the old gate, I know that 
He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, it says in John 1. These are the old gates. Proverbs 22 and 28 says, Do not remove the ancient landmarks which our fathers have set. Isaiah 51, 9 says, Awake, awake. Put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as it is in the ancient days, in the generation of old. Are you not the arm? Are you not the arm that cut Rahab apart and wondered and wounded the serpents? Are you not the ancient one, the one that will bring us through to the end? Jeremiah 18, 15 says, Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to worthless idols, and they have caused themselves to stumble in their ways because they left, what, the ancient paths to walk in a pathway that is not on the highway. You see, we need the old gate. When you have the old gate, you don't forget how God saw you through. When you have the old gate, you don't forget that mom and dad was able to pray through, that their parents had a relationship with God. <clears throat> and we are what we are today because the last generation didn't quit on who God is. And that's the reason why we must not quit on who God is because we got the generation in front of us that's counting on us to stand and have the old gate operating in our life. Is anybody with me? Then number six was the refuge gate. The refuge gate. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 13. And I went out by night through the valley gate, through the serpent wall and the refuge gate, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates were burned with fire. <clears throat> Why is it called the refuge gate? Some translations call it the dung gate. It was, where the, it was where all the trash and all the refuge went out through that gate. You ever go to a restaurant at McDonald's or a Burger King and looking so nice and everything's looking great or maybe, a, maybe you go to a gas station and all the pizzazz out front and all the stuff that they got for sale and you're on your way out and you pass the dumpster. The gates are open in the dumpster and it's full and boxes are flowing out and you get a little whiff of something real bad as you're going by. That's the refuge gate. <laughs> Is anybody following me? I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about. Because more refuge, refuge was carried out this gate <clears throat> and to the dump than any other gate. The first mention of this gate... <clears throat> Is in connection with sacrifice. The dung and the refuge and the animal parts after the sacrifices, the animal parts that was left over, that was not part of the, uh, that was not put on the altar, was taken out of the refuge gate and taken out to the dump to be burned outside the camp. There's a certain thing in our life that needs to be taken out sometimes of the refuge gate. Sometimes those things that will creep in. Sometimes those attitudes. <clears throat> sometimes those little besetting sins that will come, come in and try to grip us. And if we embrace them and we don't take them out the refuge gate and, 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 and put them under the blood, we're going to find out it will try to destroy you. Anybody with me? The reason why the refuge had to be taken out because if it wouldn't have been taken out the city and taken outside to the dump... <clears throat> It would have eventually affected the whole city. The whole city would have stenched with a refuge and, 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 and there would be a trash everywhere. In fact, whenever Nehemiah went to build the walls, before he could build the walls and before he could build the gate, you know what he had to do? He had to get the trash out. Trash was everywhere. Fallen, uh, fallen bricks and fallen wood and, 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 and the buildings were collapsed and it was nothing but a, uh, but a disaster and he had to clean up and get all the trash out before he could start to rebuild. We have to examine our life sometimes and say, is there any trash that's hindering God's work in my life? Is there any hidden thing? Is there anything that's causing me not to be what God wants me to be? Oh God, help me. Help me to get 
Open up the refuge gate and get the refuge out. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8 says, Yes, indeed, I also count all things lost. Listen. I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count it all rubbish, all refuge. Some translation says all dung, that I may gain Christ. Sometimes we need to take a look at our life and say, is there any refuge? Is there anything that's in the way of me and God? Anything stumbling, anything holding back his anointing? And then the seventh gate is the water gate found in Nehemiah chapter 3. Moreover, it says that they made repairs in front of the water gate towards the east of the projecting tower. I don't know if you, any of you can remember back in the days when Nixon was the president. There's a few folks that can remember. And the name of the conspiracy was called the water gate. And back then, I was, reading through the, I was reading through the Bible. I was reading through the Living Bible. And I happened to be reading through Nehemiah, and all of a sudden, I read this thing called the Watergate. I said, this must be a God thing. Somewhere along the line, God's in this. <laughs> but it was called the Watergate. This was where the springs of the east side of the Kindred Valley sprung up. Jesus is the living water. Do you know that? In John 4 and chapter 10, Jesus answered the woman at the well. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have to ask him and he would give you living water. Jesus is the living water. That's the reason why we need to spend some time at the water gate. We need to know he is the flow. He's the freshness. He's the, he's the living water that will give you life. The Psalms 87 and 7 says, Both the singers and the players on the instruments say, All my springs of joy are in you, O Lord. Isaiah 41 and verse 17, it says, The poor and needy seek water, but there's none. Their tongues fail for thirst, and the Lord will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valley." I'll make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land spring up with water. He is our pool. He is our source. He is our water supply. He's our water gate. Number eight. There was one called the horse gate. Horse gate. It's found in Nehemiah 3 and 28. And beyond the horse gate, the priests made repairs each in front of their own house. Because of the horse's connection with the kings, all the kings and the royalty had horses. Most of the common people had donkeys, but the royalty had horses, and they came in and out of this horse gate. Horses represent authority. Horses represent strength and speed. Jesus will come back on a white horse. This gate must be in your life to have power and recognize that our power and our strength comes from the Holy Spirit. Carry here in Jerusalem till the Holy Ghost comes upon you that you might have power to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and the other most parts of the world. Revelation 6.2 says, I took and behold a white horse. He who sat on it, <clears throat> he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and was a conqueror. Number nine is the east gate. This is a very important gate. And I'll get to these real quickly. Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 29 after then, they made repairs in front of his house. And the keeper of the east gate made repairs. This was the east gate. I saw the east gate. It's interesting that the east gate in Jerusalem is all boarded up with concrete, wood, concrete. It's, it, nobody goes in and out. Uh, the gates are closed behind it, and they're all uh, com completely blocked off because we know one day Jesus is going to come and break that eastern sky. And when he does, he's going to set up his kingdom. And I guess, I guess those that don't believe thought if they just board up that eastern gate, Jesus can't get through. <laughs> How many of you think that that's not going to stop him? This was the east of the temple. 
the east gate is a reminder that one day Jesus will come and he'll bust the eastern sky and he'll set up his kingdom and will reign with him forever. Number 10 is the Mifkid gate. The Mifkid gate. After him, one of the goldsmiths, Ray to be pair in Nehemiah 3 and verse 31. And in front of the Mifkid gate, and as far as the upper room of the corner, this word Mifkid is not found anywhere else in the Bible. So there's two, there's two significance about this gate. Number one, there's some, things in, there's some things in our Christian life that we just won't understand until we get to heaven. If you try to figure God out, hey, you'll find yourself getting frustrated because now we, only look, now we look through a looking glass darky, but one day face to face with him, we'll know all things even as we're known. Nowhere else is this mentioned. Some Bible translators call it a muster gate. And if you look up the word muster, it was what, the, it was what David used uh, to put his men in rank and in order. In the Christian life, there will always be some things unknown. Those things that we'll only know when we get to heaven. And the Mithkid gate can remind you of that. But we do find this mustard gate, which means uh, to inspect, to improve, and to acquire a standard. How many of you know in the midst of the things that we don't understand, we need to walk according to the standard of God's word? He'll still keep us in track, and he'll still keep us informed. He'll still keep us knowledgeable. Number 11 is called the Ephraim Gate. The Ephraim Gate. Ephraim was Jacob's grandson and Joseph's son. Ephraim is a tribal name because the most powerful leaders, and he's the one that received the closest land when it came to the settlement in Canaan. The Ephraim Gate represents order. It represents leadership. God wants strong, godly leaders in the church today. He wants strong, godly leaders in our homes today. He wants God's strong, godly leaders in our government. Can anybody say amen? amen? He wants us to lead under the anointing and the presence of God. Don't ever forget the Ephraim gate. And the last one, number 12 of 12 gate. Listen. I'm taking just a few moments, but I'm closing. The last gate is the prison gate. The prison gate, Nehemiah 12, 39. And above, and above the gate of Ephraim, about the old gate, and above the fish gate and the tower, the tower of hundreds as far as the sheep gate, and they stop by the gate of prison. Just a word about the prison gate. We must never forget that we are all prisoners and bond servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. He paid the price for you and for me. We're bond servants. We have submitted ourselves to be servants of him. And the last thought is. And that though we are free in Christ Jesus. Because he set us free. There's many that are still in prison to sin. There's many that are still in bondage to the world. There's many that are still captivated by the devil's devices. And we must always remember the prison gate and pray for them and be a witness and be a light and be salt. Because in Christ Jesus, we can all be free. Can I hear an amen? Anybody get anything out of this this morning? The 12 gates of the city. The 12 gates of the city will make a difference if you'll not forget them. Not forget them. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. Nobody looking around. Maybe you're here this morning you don't know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. If you noticed, every one of these gates pointed to Jesus. Every one of these gates pointed to our spiritual relationship with him. That God put these gates in our life so we can use them as checks and balances. That we can walk circumspectly, upright, true, and anointed. Maybe you're here this morning you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior. I like to believe every person here is born again. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior. Maybe you'll say, Pastor, what can I do to be saved? 
by simply doing this, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. Acknowledge that God raised Christ from the dead. And the Bible says you'll be saved. But you've got to do it from your heart. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. Or maybe you're here this morning and you used to serve God. You used to be strong in the things of God. But circumstances and pressures and ungodly activities hurts from somebody wounded you if you die tonight you'd go to heaven God bless you but you're not where you should be with God to serve him maybe it's time for you to come home maybe God's calling you back to where you need to be if that's you this pastor would be privileged and honored to pray with you